Finance and Board of Education. It's Tuesday, June 10th. Board members have a copy of the agenda in front of them. We'll first start with the Pledge of Allegiance. States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next item, the approval of the agenda. Uh, and I, as I understand it, we do have a, an amendment or a change. Tom? Just a request uh, that under the consent agenda items, we would move the expenditure uh, item number two out under out from consent agenda uh, consent items into a separate line. There are some expenditures to the YMCA that, in that one, so I'd like to have that moved out if possible, and so I can vote on the, con the rest of the consent agenda items. Okay, <clears throat> so we would move the expenditures under consent items and possibly. Uh, retitle that as uh, item 11B and then move the other items, the Rivercrest Facility Utilization Agreement C and ratification of the custodial trap uh, contract D. Board members agreeable to that? I'll entertain a motion. Mr. President, I move for approval of the agenda as amended. We second. Have a, we have a motion by Mark, a second by Barb. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motions approved. The next item is the gateway donation. And we also uh, have Scott here with, with the union. So I believe we're going to stand up front so May can get a picture. Scott, you want to come on down? Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. Yep. <clears throat> that was a, a donation towards the Gateway Project. So again, thank you to the West Central Education Association for their donation of $500. Okay. We'll move on to uh, student, staff, community recognition. Sandy? The first recognition, recognition we'd like to share this evening is last month, I'm sure you recall, we had the high school Destination Imagination team here as they were on their way to global competition. And we are very excited to report that they placed first. First place in global competition um, overpowering Singapore is kind of the way the article goes. And the members of the team were David Schoberg, Ashley Annenson, Sydney Milanofi, Josh Koch Fogarty, Emily Kepelis, and Adam Salon. And we want to congratulate that team for just their outstanding efforts. This is the third time in their careers that they have taken first place. So that's quite an accomplishment. Thank you. Thank you very Next, we'd like to recognize our spring athletics, and we'll start, we have Mr. Hilding, John Hilding here, coach of the tennis team, with two of our young men who went to state, and let's see if I can remember, John Dahl and Josh Simon, and he'll give us a little summary of the team success, tennis team success, and... Um... In here? Yes. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, we had another good tennis season, and it was highlighted by the play of these two 
gentlemen, that's Josh Simon there and John Dahl. Uh, Josh and John played doubles for us, and they were first team all conference. They went to the sectional meet, placed third, and earned a state tournament bid. And so they went down to the state tournament and performed very, very well. I also want to say that not only are they great tennis players, but they're extraordinary students. Uh, John served as captain of our tennis team this spring, and Josh is regularly on the honor rolls. And so congratulations to both these guys. Thank you. Good job. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hildeen and, and Josh and John. Good job. And then we'd also like to recognize the accomplishments of our track team this spring. And with us tonight, I see both, we have both coaches, Tom Klatt and Don Krupa with us. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm kind of losing my voice, so you have to bear with me. Um, the boys track team, we ended up, we were second in conference this year. We took five individuals down to state. Um, we had three individuals, John Roberts, Adam Zeiss, and Neil Kivy in the 3200, John Roberts in the 1600, Mike Lugatis in the discus, and Brody Swenson in the high jump. Um, nobody got on the box, um, but just about all of them PR'd and had their personal best. Um, we had a great track season, 155 kids total, boys and girls. Um, just a great group of kids and, and look forward to a great season next year. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the uh, girls track team. I have uh, Rachel Zacker who ran the 3200 for us at state meet and she's only a sophomore so she's got two years left and and it was a great honor to bring her down there because she had to run a personal best to to get to state and uh, she improved that record also her own record at state meet and uh, we had uh, 15 girls that advanced to state competition uh, they did not only stand for and represent the rest of the, their teammates in lacrosse, but also did a tremendous job representing Hudson High School. These girls truly optimized that it means what it means to set high standards and goals, and then to work hard both in and out of their season to meet them. The girls embody all parts of athletics in their camaraderie, sportsmanship, and drive to reach their goals. And thank you once again on behalf of the Hudson Girls Track and Field team. And this is a comment from uh, Coach uh, Holm because she was not able to be here today. And uh, Katie Cumming was uh, another girl that was there last year and placed first in the 32 and also again this year in the 32. She uh, had a misfortune in the 1600. Uh, with 500 meters to go, someone stepped on the back of her heel and pulled her shoe partway off and she had to make a decision, either run with the shoe partway on or to uh, kick it off and run barefoot and uh, she decided to kick it off and she just couldn't get the um, the power that she needed to excel and she fi ended up finishing 11th but she did win the 32 the night before and Rachel was uh, on that 32 uh, with the rest of the team. Uh, we had um, let's see uh, Hillary Fireisen was there last year too in the pole vault, and uh, she placed third again this year. She was second last year and the third this year in the pole vault, so she again did a good job. Sydney Melanfi in the uh, 300 hurdles, she was sixth and got to stand on the podium. And uh, besides the seniors that graduated, we have a tremendous team coming back next year, and uh, and we hope to um, be down there again and represent Hudson. So thank you very much for allowing us to come here tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you, Don. Thank you, coaches, and congratulations, Rachel, and the other student athletes. Thanks again. And then our final recognition. <laughs> our final recognition is with the middle school. Um, there are students in the business class that annually compete in the stock market game. And our, we had two teams, one took sixth and one took seventh this year in that national competition. So we're very pleased to also report that. Very good. Sandy, Thank are you. any of those middle schoolers available for uh, personal services? <laughs> they, uh, we can check. <laughs> Congratulations to them as well. We'll move on to agenda item six, comments to Board of Education. 
um, from, looks like a list of students. We'll start with uh, Brandon Crockett. Brandon, if you could uh, step before the microphone and if you could state your name, please, again. And hey, how doing? Um, I'm Brandon Crockett. Um, I participated in um, the Vandal Acts of last year, June 3rd, 2007, just over a year ago. Um, you know, bottom line, you guys, I'm, I'm sorry for, uh, for that whole thing. Um, since day one, I've been, um, you know, embarrassed and uh, I knew it was wrong when we did it and I knew it was wrong afterwards. Um, you know, I wish I could take it back. I can't. Um, you just have to learn from your mistakes and um, I think that's the most important part. We all make mistakes. Um, I'm not saying it was right by any means. I'm, I mean, I think we're all taking responsibility for what we did. And I would just like to apologize to every one of y'all for um, having to put up with it. Um, it's something that you shouldn't have to put up with. And I mean, again, life changing lesson. And, and you know, I just want to say I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Nick Filipiak. Uh, hello, my name is Nick Filipiak, and I'm sure you guys know, a year ago I participated in a crime that should have never happened, and uh, I realized the damage that it caused this school and my community, my friends, and my family, and again, I am terribly sorry for what I did. Uh, on the last note, uh, I just want to say that you won't see me in the criminal records again, and I am terribly sorry for what I have done. Uh, I appreciate you hearing us out today, and I uh, thanks for your time. Thank you. Nate? Oh, hi, I'm Nate Kovach, and uh, I'd like to apologize for the incident that took place on June 3rd, 2007. Um, I, know, I realize now that this went way beyond a senior prank, and that it hurt and was very dis disrespectful to more people than I thought it would be. I'd also like to apologize for all the trouble that you guys went through through this incident. You guys shouldn't have had to go through that. Um, I hope sometime in the future you guys can forgive us for this incident that took place and for the disrespectful actions that we did. Um, I know this hurt the pride and respect of us, all the schools that were, intent, uh, that were involved, including ours the most, and I hope that the underclassmen can learn from our mistakes and that this doesn't happen again. Um, it didn't seem like it at the first time, but it, these were more hurtful than we all intended it would to be when we first planned this and that we intended. And, but we have all grown through this and learned a lot from it, and we all wish we could go back and take it back, but we can't. But I would just like to apologize for our actions. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Peter. Okay. Peter's not here. Peter Mackey. Uh, Andrew Olson. <clears throat> My name's uh, Andy Olson. Um, I would just like to apologize uh, for uh, my actions. Um, I was involved in the vandalism. Um, I was not thinking uh, when I decided to go. Um, I've learned from it now, um, taking responsibility for it, and uh, um, need to own up to my mistake. Um, and uh, I also know now that I have to earn back the trust of everyone. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Michael Peruca. Hi, I'm Michael Peruca. I just want to apologize to all of you for my actions as with everyone else for the vandalism and for putting the embarrassment on you people, the school, and my family. And I just hope that you can all accept my apology from the bottom of my heart and can all move on from this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Jacob Walchak. Hey. Um, I'd like to apologize to the school board for the unnecessary and negative attention that was drawn to you guys and the Hudson, the whole school district. Um, I realized that what we did was completely unacceptable. Um, I'm, I hope you can see that we're taking responsibility and we're trying to learn from the mistakes that we made. And once again, I'm sorry for the embarrassment we've caused. 
Thanks. Okay, thanks, Jake. Sam Wegleitner. Hi, I'm Sam Wegleitner, and I was also involved on the vandalism. And I just want to apologize for all the, just, I mean, the damage, the time, just all the hurtful feelings and all the distress in the community that were caused. My, and I would like to apologize for my lack of leadership to step up and say that this is a wrong thing and that this should not have taken place. Whereas it could have just been as easy as just one kid to say, hey, what are we thinking, guys? And I think I should have done that. I just want to say I'm sorry, and it's really heartfelt, and thanks for your time. Okay. Thank you, students. And, uh, you know, as you know, it, it did <clears throat> cause some hardship for this school district as well as community. Um, but I think over the course of the past year, it sounds as if each one of you has learned an important lesson. And that's the key, uh, key piece in all of this is that, you know, mistakes do happen. Um, but the important part of it is to make sure that we all learn from it. And it sounds like you've done that. So I do appreciate you coming before the board. And uh, we certainly wish you the best of luck, whatever you may be doing right now. Thank you. We'll move on to the next item on the agenda approval of the May 13th, 2008 regular and closed session Board of Education meeting minutes. I would move approval, Mr. President, of the May 13th, 2008 regular and closed session Board of Education meeting minutes. We have a motion by Tom, a second. A second by Lynn. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 If those opposed, motions approved. Correspondence, I believe we do have some correspondence. We have one piece of correspondence from um, uh, Diane Carter, retiring teacher, who just wants to acknowledge the recognition that she received at the, uh, at the recognition banquet on her retirement and the plaque received. And so it was a nice note from uh, our Diane Carter. Okay, thank you, Tom. We'll move on to the superintendent report, Mary. Each, each month I've been reporting on the sustainability features of Rivercrest and focusing on particular ones. Um, this month I'm going to focus on water efficiency and indoor air quality. Uh, water efficiency has been very interesting to the people who have been on tour, uh, board members as well, particularly when you're looking at the fixtures in the restroom. And uh, this is new for many of us, dual flush valves and waterless urinals in each of the uh, restroom facilities. And this will be something that our, both our students and staff are going to learn about. Um, these kind of fixtures save water. In fact, we anticipate savings in the excess of 40% of saving of water, which is very significant, obviously. Uh, we also have low flow lavatory faucets in each of the restrooms as well. So um, that helps with our water efficiency and preserving or conserving our natural resources. As far as indoor air quality, uh, that has been a major uh, focus uh, at Rivercrest. And so the indoor air quality has been a high priority. Um, this is achieved with a combination of measures including low or no uh, volatile organic compounds, also known as VOCs, and um, they look for products that have specific adhesives, paints, flooring um, systems, and carpeting and furniture that have these qualities. Uh, also composite wood and agrofiber products um, that do not use formaldehyde are specified. Um, care is taken to provide indoor air in amounts that meet lead um, requirements that we've talked about before. And carbon dioxide levels will be constantly monitored to, to make sure that the air is of high quality. Uh, classrooms, as you know, have 100% outside air uh, provided, and um, classrooms, offices, and other areas will have the option of using natural ventilation because of the windows are operable um, in many places in the building. 
It, air quality will also be maintained over um, time because of the cleaning uh, program that we will be using. We'll be using green products, and this is something we are trying out at Rivercrest to identify which products are the most effective um, in cleaning for us so that we can expand those to the rest of the district. So we'll be starting with Rivercrest. Um, during construction, air quality was also maintained by preventing contamination of um, assorbative materials such as insulation, carpeting, ceiling tile, gypsum wallboard um, for moisture damage. So that was another um, important characteristic that happened during construction. And uh, this is something that I didn't know uh, initially. The use of diesel fuel, forklifts, and other construction tools was restricted. Prior to occupancy, um, there will be a building flush out or the air will be tested for contamination levels. So again, uh, we will be monitoring levels uh, throughout. We've been doing that throughout the construction and we'll continue to do that um, as the building uh, starts into operation. And lastly, facility cleaning and maintenance areas um, have isolated exhaust systems to make sure we get rid of contaminants um, in those areas specifically that are used. And Mr. President, if I then can move on yeah, to ahead. preparation for opening Rivercrest. Uh, I'm pleased to really announce that we're on schedule. In fact, um, our timeline, as I've said before, to build Rivercrest and construct it was um, not lengthy. It was a short timeline, and we really have our construction managers to thank for their uh, good management of this project and certainly Jim Stasco from our own staff who has um, been on site and represented us well. Uh, Tim Erickson has also worked on this, but um, the building is underway and will open on time. In fact, um, we're going to move in sooner than we have in some of our previous buildings. Usually when you construct a new school, you're right down to the wire of opening classrooms and you're still moving in. Uh, we don't plan to do that at Rivercrest. If we are, it will be very minimal. And um, so some of the dates that I'm going to share with you are really representative of that. We have been working since construction started or even before that with a team of people who have been managing different aspects of the uh, preparation procedure. Pat Hodges, certainly principal, uh, Nancy Sweet, Sandy Kovach, Barbara Poon, Tim Erickson, Peg Shoemaker, Jim Stasekel, and Tracy Habishaline. And so the, the things that you're going to hear about are the results of their efforts working all year long. We had a list that was much larger than this piece of paper, and now it's down to just these things. Uh, grade level materials are currently um, in the district uh, that have no long, are no longer needed in their particular school, have been identified, and will be moved um, to Rivercrest and to the other schools as well. You know, since we've shifted um, our population, there are some changes throughout the district. So we're using the curriculum materials that we currently have first before we buy new uh, curriculum materials. Curriculum orders have been submitted by Sandy, and um, we're also monitoring closely the grade level sections throughout the district. Uh, we may bring some um, additional requests for teaching staff to you in July, as we had uh, told you before, for um, enrollment increases. The media center order has been submitted, so we're underway for that, and we have places identified when those orders come in where they can be stored. Boxes for packing have been in school since um, in May, and so teachers have been working diligently. Saw some more there today, uh, continuing to pack. Uh, communication to s staff about what will be moved and staging sequence for moving materials has already occurred. And that's not just river crest, that's building to building at the elementary level. So Jim Stasekel and his crew have really um, put together a, a good orchestration of that plan. Um, the plan for the office at Rivercrest to move in is mid-July. Registration for Rivercrest, though, will be maintained at Willow River office because we don't have the occupancy <coughs> certificate that we need for um, people outside to come in, the public to come in at that time. So it will uh, remain at uh, Willow River for the rest of the summer, most of the summer. Uh, there will be two furniture moves. The first one starts July 21st for grade levels one through five. And um, then the second one is August 4th, the remainder of the um, 
furniture would moved in at that time and it will take about one um, maybe up to two weeks for each one for delivery and setup of those uh, of that furniture substantial completion of the building is estimated for August 4th so a really good date for us when we're looking at the beginning of school um, we need to have that occupancy certificate, as I said, um, from the city to let teachers really move into the building. We expect that to happen, um, if it can't happen soon after August 4th, it would be mid-August, which again is pretty early when opening up a new building of the size. Uh, we have um, meet the teacher night scheduled for August 27th, 5.30 to 7.30. Um, we also need to set up an open house for our staff so that they can go through the building. And we haven't set that date yet, but we plan to do that before school starts. Uh, Camp St. Croix has sent out initial information about their school age care program that will be provided for Rivercrest students. And uh, we have a dedication day, which the title of that is Designing for the Future. And it's scheduled for Saturday, September, I think 27th, um, from 8 to 2. And there will be activities and events both at uh, the Rivercrest site and at Camp St. Croix. So it will be a fun family day. We hope to start with um, a race that goes on our trail around our site, goes through the gateway and into the trails on the campsite as well. And if you have any questions, I will uh, be happy to answer them with uh, help from Sandy and Tim and Barb as well. Any, any questions for Kathy or her team? If not, it, uh, Mary, that's really exciting. It sounds like we're making great progress, and I think we all look forward to that day when we can see the finished product. So, and it's really exciting as well that they're on on target for the completion. Um, we'll move on to board reports, um, board of education committee assignments. Board members in their packet of materials uh, can see the. Each of the committees, the chairs, and the membership. Um, so, if you have any questions about that, certainly I can field field it now, or we can discuss it uh, at a later time. Uh, but just briefly, the governance and policy committee is chaired by myself. Facilities and grounds is chaired by Tom Holland. Finance is chaired by Brian Bell, who's also the treasurer. Learning and program development chaired by Barb Van Loren and personnel and negotiations chaired by Mark Kaiser Scott. So thank you everyone for your willingness to serve as chairs of those respective committees. And then also the Intergovernmental Advisory Council, Tom Holland is serving on that. The 2008-09 board meeting dates are also in your board materials. Um, if you have any questions regarding those dates, I think they're and pretty much the second Tuesday of, of each month. There's a few exceptions, either for a work session or annual meeting or possibly additional meeting that's scheduled during the month. So, but uh, let us know if you have any questions regarding those dates. I would like to make one comment about that for our community, just um, to let them know that we will be holding board meetings starting in October at the Rivercrest Multipurpose Room. So um, we look forward to that. It's a good. little uh, smaller uh, space than this auditorium space, and uh, we'll be closer to the people that join us for those meetings. Mm -hmm. Good, thanks, thanks, Mary. Okay, um, final report is a 612 space for learning, high school program needs, Mary. And Ed's going to join me up here, and um, if you would grab a chair as you come on up, Ed, that would help. Certainly, Principal Ed Lucas is the authority on um, program needs in the high school, and I'll, I'll get us started, and then Ed's going to um, add much more specific comments. When we think about space for learning, um, I really think of uh, three different areas that uh, we need to address or think about. Number one is how many seats do we need? How many students do we have? Um, what's our enrollment? What's our projected enrollments? How much classroom space do we need for that? And we've um, touched on that, certainly with our projections and looking at those to the future 
Uh, so forth, knowing that the high school has a capacity for um, 1,680 students. The second area is really our educational program and how does the space serve our educational program. And along with that um, would be included our core facilities like our cafeteria or our auditorium um, because when you think of our educational program, certainly that is the work that our staff and our students do within our schools. So that's what we're going to be really focusing on this evening is that educational program and the needs and concerns that we have in relationship to serving the number of students we have now and the number of students who are projected in the future. And lastly, um, infrastructure. Certainly that's your heating and ventilating system, it's your um, energy systems and your uh, plumbing. But we're not really going to touch much on those this evening. That's uh, for another time. All of these three areas interact, so we will have some comments that, that touch on those um, beyond the educational program. But just to let you know, that's what we're really going to focus on this evening is the educational program um, needs and future program needs uh, in relationship to this space. There's some information in the handout for you about the high school and knowing that it was two original buildings. Uh, one was built in the 60s, that's the West Wing, and it was opened as a junior high, and then the second, um, the East Wing, was built in the 70s, and it was opened as a new high school. So, you know, the age of the major portion of this building ranges from 33 to 45, essentially, years old. Uh, they then, um, in 1975, oops, I already read that, sorry. Uh, when the current middle school was then built in 1994, um, the two buildings and the high school site were joined together. And so that became the new larger high school. And uh, then there was a remodeling that occurred in 1997 uh, that uh, added this auditorium and additional instructional spaces like the biology labs that we have over in the West Wing. As we look at projected increases of enrollment, um, they certainly require more uh, classroom seats for learning. And then we look at the quality of our space needs that affect the educational program. And when we uh, look at that uh, overall, there's some uh, three different areas that I think are um, significantly affected that we need to, that provide challenges for us over time to continue that uh, quality educational program that we have now. First is the limited size of some of the classrooms. Um, knowing that they were built you know, in the um, 60s and the 70s, if we look at the east side classrooms, um, Ed's told me that they range generally from 700 square feet to 900 square feet. And just to give you a relationship with that, um, at Rivercrest, uh, one through five, they range about 900 square feet, but they also have the resource rooms. Now we're thinking of smaller children as opposed to our um, teenagers who are in the high school, much larger uh, in size. So just that gives you a reference point. We also look at this space in relationship to instructional flexibility and what kind of instruction um, is needed. And, this, and instruction has changed from the 60s and 70s. Certainly at that time, um, students stayed in their uh, seats and their desks for a greater portion of their learning time. And when we look at um, current instruction strategies, uh, that's much different. Certainly the teacher works with the whole class, but they also work with small groups and large groups and individuals and combinations of all of those uh, kind of groups. Sometimes they're working on computers, sometimes they're working at their desk. Um, it's a much more flexible environment and, and requires more space as a result. If we had um, the space in this building and we didn't have as many students and really at that capacity level that we have now, we could renovate some of the space and combine spaces so that we would have better um, learning learning classrooms that are, were of adequate size. But really, um, that's not an option for us at the present time with the four-year high school um, being housed in this space. Second area is limited access to technology. Certainly, um, 
technology is one of the learning tools, a very important learning tool for our students. And uh, throughout the high school, in many, many areas, um, the, we need more accessibility or student accessibility to computers and smart boards and the other technology uh, tools of learning for them. And then another area causing us challenge is equipment moder modernization. Um, that affects instruction, it affects curriculum and learning, and um, certainly the equipment sometimes takes more room than the space that we currently have. So we can't just renovate it and put in that new equipment. Um, our science labs are an example of that that Ed's gonna talk about soon. So I wanna really um, compliment the high school staff. They have done an outstanding job using um, this facility and uh, even with the challenges that we have to provide a quality education for our students. But when we look to the future, particularly with um, the global marketplace, HSD 2025, and continuing to provide that high quality education that we do in Hudson, um, we really have some additional challenges for us. And so Ed's going to take some time now and talk about some specific areas and highlight some of the um, challenges that we have with us. Well, good evening. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to defend my territory and to uh, re revisit and for the new board, board members to uh, enlighten about our situation here at the, at the high school. I'll start with the first area, generally talking about the classrooms, and I'm not going to go through all of these bulleted items specifically with you. You can read those, but I'll talk in more general terms. Uh, One thing, Ed, I just want to make sure everybody has the updated copy that was at your place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. First of all, I'd like to thank you for uh, when central offices moved out of the high school, we opened up seven additional classrooms, and those have been hugely significant in spreading out our population throughout the high school. Uh, it really eliminated some major congestion areas, improved instruction because it took teachers off of carts and put them into the classrooms. And we currently have two part-time teachers who will be on carts for next year. So all of the teachers will have their classrooms for their prep hours, and they will all have their classrooms for study halls. Uh, but that is pretty much the extent of where we are at with our population. We are maxed out with that. Uh, as uh, was mentioned, our classrooms range in size from right around 700 square feet to 900 square feet. And we've done quite a bit of shifting over the years to maximize our space. And uh, at the current time, we are basically out of space. And it's been like that uh, for some time, but as we've been, had to have been creative, we, we made room and we were uh, able to, I think we're pretty close to 100% efficiency here with utilizing all of our space. Uh, with the variation in different sized classrooms, that really does put a, a crimp on the teaching style within the classrooms, especially when we get to those smaller sized classrooms that uh, have a capacity of 30 students. And especially with high school students trying to uh, do differentiation and uh, create different activities for the students in those classrooms becomes very difficult. Uh, we do not also have a large central meeting place for individual classrooms to gather together. Uh, we've, I'll talk a little bit later about restructuring some computer labs, uh, but we did make one space available in the east side where we could possibly take two classes and meet together as a, for a field trip or to have a guest speaker. Our other option is to come down here to the auditorium and use the auditorium for large gatherings. And we often do that for in-house field trips when we have to combine classes together. The study halls are currently held in the classrooms. Uh, we cannot use the cafeteria for study halls because we have three driver's ed classes going on there in the morning and that it, that's a large area. It's not the best learning space for the driver's ed classes because we have the cooks preparing uh, lunches for the students in the morning. Uh, we have uh, vending machines down there that kick on and off during the day. We have traffic that goes through there uh, as students pass during the day. But we're making use of it and uh, it is working at the present time. The teachers, of course, as I said, have uh, space to prepare for their lessons in their individual classrooms, but we don't have additional space for them to gather if they're going to be working on interdisciplinary projects. 
Uh, we have to try to coordinate that so teachers have prep hours together with it. It doesn't always work. Uh, we just don't have the meeting spaces available. Any questions on the general classrooms and the, the conditions of those rooms? I just, I just have a good, what is the uh, standard? Oh, I'm sorry, I turned it off. Uh, Ed, what is the standard size um, recommended uh, classroom for high school students? I know you mentioned that we fall in the 700 to 900 range, but uh, what is the uh, target size? I don't remember what ATS and ours recommended size was, but it's right around that 900. 900 is on the low end. Okay. And especially when you get to your specialized rooms it, with your science rooms, your physics labs, 900, is very, 900 square feet is very small. Okay. Our current science labs are approximately 1,200 square feet, and, and they're small. Okay, so even, even those 1,200 square foot rooms, their science labs are marginal for yes. size. Okay. Yes. All right, thanks, Ed. Let me move on to the, the media center. Generally, the media center, the library for a school of this size is undersized. Uh, that's the bottom line on that. We have adjacent to our library a computer lab, and that computer lab is at capacity scheduled. Uh, it's full most of the time. The auditorium, uh, you've been here for many of the concerts, and the concerts have been uh, packing the auditorium. We are at capacity in this facility, and I think that's a testimony to the programs that we have here at the high school. Uh, they are very well known, they're well attended, uh, but we, are, we have been forced in the choir program to go to multiple performances so that we can accommodate all of the parents and all of the programs. And the, the same will hold through for the, for the middle school as well when they come up here and present their programs. We are, we are packed. We have three computer labs at the high school. Uh, one is in our, our LMC, our library, and we have one. Uh, we will be creating one on another computer lab on the west side of the building this year. And we last year created one on the east side of the building. So we have a, a total of three of those labs available, and they are used extensively throughout the day. Uh, of course, there, with more technology coming online, there's more and more use. The more, uh, the more we advance uh, and educate our students in the area of technology, the more, more there is a greater need within the classroom. So we're going to have to look at um, how we're going to accommodate that in the future. We currently do have uh, what we call cow labs, computer labs on wheels, and they are laptop computers that teachers roll into their classrooms and use those as support technology as well. Uh, there is some, those are heavily used as well. Uh, there are some management problems with those because we have so many students using those on a regular basis, and it requires maintenance to keep those up as well. So they are working, but we could and do need the additional space for computer labs. Ed, I know you talked to me um, today about those labs, the portable labs, and that um, one of the difficulties we talked about was we don't really have any space to store them. The labs, I believe, have 15 stations on each lab. Each that... lab, correct. And so um, we don't have the storage facilities to really even maintain that kind of uh, technology access. And that as we'll address a little bit later with storage space in general, there we are out of storage space at the high school. The cafeteria, we currently run three lunches in the cafeteria, and each of those lunches is at capacity. We, we cram in over 500 students into the lunch room, and we are very, very fortunate that we have outstanding students here at the high school because we've had minimal problems with uh, behavior issues at, during those lunches. But uh, f putting 500 students in is a task and requires quite a bit of supervision. And as, we en as the enrollment increases, we're going to have to look at a couple of different options. And one would be to change our schedule and to go to four lunches instead of three lunches. Uh, all of these changes that we're going to look at at the high school are going to create domino effects. And when we look at our schedule, we have X number of minutes that we have to maintain for instruction time, and those are going to be impacted either by starting earlier or going later if we have to change our lunch periods. The class times are going to be changed as well. 
And moving in that direction and changing our schedule is a significant change for our high school and takes a tremendous amount of planning to put that in place because that we have X number of graduation requirements. And when you change that schedule and take an hour out of every day, that is going to impact the graduation requirements. So that, that whole picture for the change of schedule will have to be looked at as it uh, impacts the use of the cafeteria. And as I mentioned earlier, we have three of the periods are used for driver's ed classes. It takes uh, one period is used for the lunch itself, uh, fifth hour, which is broken into three parts. And then it does take an hour after lunch to clean the cafeteria. So we're talking about five out of the seven hours of the day for that cafeteria being used. The, we have two gyms. We have an east and a west gym. The east gym is our large gym, and that's where we held the graduation ceremony. And it was quite warm in the, in the east gym, uh, but we managed to, to move through it. It is not air conditioned, and currently when we, we put our close to 1,700 students into that gym, it is at capacity. When we have our assemblies in that gym, it's full. And so uh, as enrollment continues to go up, uh, we're going to have to look at options on, on how we uh, bring our students together, our entire student body together. And of course, that does impact uh, the physical education classes that I'll, I will talk about later. Our hallways, uh, many of you have been in our hallways during passing time, they are crowded. Uh, we have moved lockers out of the hallways and relocated them into other less used hallways. Uh, but again, we, we've done as much as we possibly can do in that capacity. Uh, the east, uh, the, excuse me, the outside hallway is the sidewalk between the east and the west side is used on a regular basis, rain, shine, storms, uh, students have to use that uh, because we simply cannot fit everyone into, into our main hallways during passing time. Um, any additional uh, changes that we would make or additions uh, in terms of classrooms adding on anywhere, of course, would lengthen the amount of time that students would be able to, would travel from one end of the building to the other. And so that, again, it's the domino effect. If we create more space on this current site, then passing times are going to be impacted with that as well. And of course, it's just the, the congestion itself. When we look at students carrying backpacks, and students do need to, to carry those backpacks because we don't have enough locker space. So it's kind of a, it's a no-win situation. We, uh, because students travel so far from one end of the building to the other, uh, it's difficult for them to, to get back and forth. And the schedule just doesn't, because the schedule is random, it's very difficult to put students in one location in the morning and in another location in the afternoon. So the scheduling uh, does impact uh, locker space as well in terms of students do have to carry their books with them from class to class. And the more backpacks we have, the more limited we are in terms of space in the hallways. And of course, it becomes a safety issue as well. When we look at our parking, you know that our parking situation is, is maxed out. Uh, we do offer our parking permits to seniors first uh, and then juniors. Sophomores really utilize St. Pat's parking lot. And the additional space across the street, uh, we're thankful for St. Pat's because they are allowing us to do that. But it does create some supervision problems for us. And it also creates problems when uh, St. Pat's would be having a funeral, a wedding, or some other gathering during the day that our students then would have to find other places to park. Again, the domino effect when we talk about emergency or evacuation situa evacuations within the building as our enrollment grows, so grows our, our process for evacuation and the challenges that go along with that. Uh, we are maxed out at, again, it's with St. Pat's. We utilize the upper level of the church and we do fill it to capacity. They do have the lower level available uh, and we, we use that for overflow. We use that for counselors to work with students uh, during those emergency evacuations because uh, students get become afraid and need assistance. Our special ed students need assistance during that time and that's where they are located in the lower level. When we look at the physical structure of our building, when 
people come onto the main cam onto the campus, they think the auditorium is our main entrance, and uh, door one actually is our entrance, and that is by the East Gym. It's difficult to see, and uh, the entrance itself uh, it creates problems for adults coming into the building, and it's difficult to monitor them. We are looking at putting in a separate camera right at the front of the door so that the secretaries can see specifically who is entering, entering the building. And that, of course, uh, leads into the office area, which, which is small for a building our size and, and inadequate to handle the adults and students that come into the building because our associate principal's office, which is by door one and the main entrance, is the door that all adults have to check into when they come into the building. So in the morning, as students are checking in and getting makeup slips, the adults are also trying to check in as well to go to other parts of the building. Housed in there are, admin, are the administrative offices, and we've carved out several storage areas, closets, and made them into administrative offices. And we've just taken the, the last one, which was our conference room, which used to be a storage room for school supplies, and we made that into our conference room. And now with the additional staff that we've added for our guidance counselor, uh, we've made, we've turned that into an office. And currently the, the teachers do not have a lunchroom other than uh, some makeshift lunchrooms that we've created. And one of those is the greenhouse, which is on top of the east wing. And it's a nice little place to meet. However, the temperature fluctuates and it can be 20 below during the winter up there too. So, or 110 degrees uh, in the spring of the year. We also took a, an old closet which is adjacent to the janitor's office on the west wing and converted that into a lunchroom for our teachers. Uh, so I would classify those as inadequate spaces for, for lunchrooms. Our conference room when we lost our, when we created a separate office this year for our new guidance person, then we took one of the last old offices on the east upper wing and created that into our a new conference room. And it's an area of about 12 by 18, and it's approximately 300 feet from our main office. So as we have adult parents come in for meetings, uh, we will have to escort them up to that area. And that room is located between some classrooms as well, but that's the last available space that we have. This year, with the uh, addition of the, the new counselor, we've, we've also moved our FYI room and in order to open up a computer lab on the east side, our freshman year initiative classroom was moved to the career center. So it's doubling as a classroom and it's also doubling as a career center. So that space is maximized as well. <coughs> We struggle with the health area, which is located in the guidance area, behind the guidance offices. Uh, we currently have two, three rooms, an office and two uh, sick rooms back there with a little bathroom to be able to accommodate 1,700 students. It is very, very tight, and there's a lot of traffic that goes through that individual area. I mentioned the lockers. We have 1,500 lockers within the building and uh, 1,700 students and nowhere else to to put those. One of the issues that we continue to face is when students share lockers. Uh, it's a safety issue, it's a possession issue, and it does create some problems. With restroom facilities and storage space, restrooms are, are maxed out, and as I said earlier, we've taken all of our storage space and either converted it into classrooms or offices or lunchrooms, and we're out. As we look at the specific, specific content areas uh, with the English rooms, which are located on the west side of the building in the old junior high wing, uh, they are small. They're right around that 900 capacity. But as you add the books, the textbooks, the storage shelves, uh, because we have no other storage space for those, those textbooks and, and books that are used, it really reduces the size of the classroom and does uh, impact instruction. Uh, the same situation exists for math and social studies. Uh, and when we add computer technology to that and the limited amount of uh, access to technology, that, that does impact uh, the classes as well. 
One of the things that in terms of uh, team teaching, when teachers are teaching the same subjects and would like to team teach together, bring their classes together, as I said, we really don't have any space to be able to do that other than to come down here and use the auditorium. Sometimes you will see teachers attempting to use the commons, but the commons area is often shared with the phi ed classes, and they overload into those areas when the over, the phi ed classes will overload into the commons when those phi ed classes are too large and we sometimes have two phi ed classes at the same time in the East Gym. And then of course, when classes are going on, we have parents coming in through the building uh, going into the athletic office, and now we'll have parents traveling through uh, up into our conference room on the east wing. When we look at the area of science, when we talk about the, the chemistry rooms, we have two chemistry rooms, and I would say that the, the chemistry rooms are adequate at this particular time. We, we do have to make some modifications and significant uh, improvements in the ventilation uh, as they, they have certain types of ventilation hoods that they have in, that, in the chemistry area, and they're very expensive, and we're going to have to replace those. They're getting old, and uh, we struggle to keep them running. The biology, as I mentioned earlier, they are limited in size, and we can uh, we max out our classes at about 26. Uh, that's about how many we can put and have all students participate in uh, lab work uh, when they're when lab is done. We we've tried for years to try to figure out a place to uh, put in the AP biology. We simply can't do it. It takes a extra area for preparation for those experiments, and uh, we don't have that space available. And so we are currently uh, holding AP biology on the books until and not offering it until we can figure out what we're going to do with it. The equipment in the science area is old, it's outdated, and it continually needs to be repaired. Physics is really struggling with the size of their classrooms because uh, they are inadequate for holding experiments. And we are currently in a science revision uh, right now in the curriculum, and physics is the area that seems to, to be very hard hit with that. They, they want to uh, incorporate new technology yeah, with those experiments, but it's very difficult. They just do not have the classroom space available to do that. When we look at uh, world languages, we, we have had requests to add new languages, but we simply don't have anywhere to put them. No, we can't house them. And our uh, German and Spanish programs are doing very, very well, but uh, we would like to consider additional programs if we had the space to do that. When we look at the, the area of art, again, we're, we're talking increased number of students in that area, and the space is limited. We currently have two classes that are taught at the same time. It's a ceramics class and a jewelry class that share one classroom. It's, uh, the classroom is a, approximately 1,200 square feet total. It's a long, narrow classroom but it's the only place that we can put our pottery wheels and consequently two teachers share at the same time and they are very good at working together and sharing classes but when you put almost 40 students, 45 students into one room, it, it's a challenge to be able to teach under those conditions. And we're looking at, we have done some updating of equipment but again some of that equipment is expensive and we simply have no place to put the new equipment if we were to to update it. And I think that that impacts when you are overloading the, the classrooms, uh, it impacts students' desire to take the classes because they know they aren't going to get the personal attention uh, that is so deeply needed with art. When we talk about music and theater, we have the orchestra coming up to the high school in a couple of years, and we do have one additional uh, band room that both choir and band use it as additional practice areas. It is not a very soundproof room, so we are going to have to look at, uh, talk to the architects on how we are going to be able to soundproof that so that we can run orchestra concurrently with the choir. 
Uh, right now it doesn't work and uh, thank goodness we have um, our teachers are able to work together and they juggle their schedules so that when choir is practicing we don't have band or practicing going on in the next room because uh, it's very difficult to focus when that happens. Uh, as we talk about uh, the expansion of the, the music program or expansion of the theater program, again, we come back to the auditorium and we have to, we're going to have to limit the number of performances that we have or we're going to have to look, become creative in how we offer those performances because the facility and practice areas uh, compromise that. As we move on to the business and marketing areas, uh, all of our biz three business rooms do have computers in them. Uh, two of those rooms are inadequate. They're very small. They, they hold 24 computers, and if you walked into those classrooms, you're going to walk into a very congested area. Uh, students are shoulder to shoulder in those rooms. Uh, they are maximizing the technology in those areas. The other room is of adequate size. Uh, that's a combination um, computer or combination uh, computer lab, business lab, and our yearbook classroom. So two out of the three are very, very small in size. Our family and consumer ed program is uh, our kitchen is uh, has been was built in the 60s. Uh, the equipment is we are currently looking at updating that equipment in that area. The teachers are becoming very, very creative in, in uh, designing a classroom and a kitchen that is mobile so they can use it for multi-purpose uh, classes and shift things around, use it in large areas, use the, the equipment in larger areas as well. Uh, but we have to consider safety in that process and the, the kitchen is really struggling at this particular point. Uh, we have one classroom where we can house sewing machines and we also, within that classroom, it serves as a multi-purpose class for other classes as well. The students have to put the sewing machines away, uh, lock them up, and then we bring other classes in. With the family and consumer, uh, in the area of family and consumer this year, we eliminated two of the foods classes because uh, we had a request for nine sections of foods and we have seven hours. So we combined as much as we could. We have a limit of 24 students that we can put into each of those classes. So we had about 48 students who were not able to take foods classes this year. In the area of Phi Ed, uh, we are maxed in that area as well. Uh, with the number of teaching stations that we have, we, the Phi Ed teachers work very, very well together. They sit down as a team and they plan out hour by hour who is going to be where in the building. That is the only way that we can schedule this, the Phi Ed sections. And we are forced to have summer school Phi Ed. It's con not only convenient for students, but there's no way that we could take all those additional students who take summer school Phi Ed, put them in during the regular year uh, we don't have, we, we physically could not be able to do that. There is no space available. And our FIA department has continually talked with me and discussed with us and with Sandy about the issue of the philosophy of uh, FIA in the curriculum that FIA should be a year long physical activity. And we're forced to modify that and change that so students can get their FIA credit during the summer. It does help them with uh, other. Uh, taking more courses, but uh, on the other hand, we couldn't do it anyway if we had them uh, take FIA during the regular year in our current situation. And of course, if we're going to look at uh, adding additional uh, space for FIA on, on this campus, uh, as an example, looking at a, another gym, uh, we would be reducing the amount of green space that we have on campus. Our special ed classrooms. Uh, I think we've done an excellent job of uh, arranging and uh, putting our special ed classrooms in areas that are of adequate size and still meeting the needs of our students, but uh, those are smaller areas. We have nowhere to go for any additional programs in terms of creating another special education area. In some of our 
classrooms and special ed that require life skills and hygiene classes, uh, the structure of the building limits us putting in sinks or uh, other hygiene areas. In the area of tech ed, uh, we have our woods, our metals, our auto shop. Uh, we have lab spaces available that have classrooms attached with them. At times, we are using those classrooms at the same time that classes are going on in the shops. So we end up doubling up sometimes, depending on how the schedule is laid out. We're looking at moving forward with a pre-engineering program called Project Lead the Way and we're not sure where we're going to put the uh, clean electronics lab at this particular point. It's a great program and we think that we can do it with our drafting room. However, we are going to do some, we would re be required to do some hand scheduling. Uh, it would displace, probably displace some teachers at some time. And of course we get to the, the area of the athletic uh, area of athletics and our facilities are are used I think uh, quite extensively uh, used all the time we have many groups from the outside that are requesting to use the facilities as well and we have to simply tell them no because we have a difficult time lining up the practices and the games with the current facility that we have there are times where we would like to add lower level teams such as ninth grade teams. We simply don't have the space to do that. We can't accommodate games, nor can we accommodate practice facilities. When we look at our Newton Field, uh, we've, thank goodness for Amy Hamburg, a principal over at EP Rock, has been helpful and worked with us in allowing our football players to use the space that's over there and the visiting teams to use it because uh, the locker rooms are, are very small for the size of teams that we have. We use temporary portable restroom facilities at all of our outside air, all of our athletic facilities uh, because we simply don't have uh, permanent structures. And when we take a look at storage throughout the district, not only for our extracurricular program, but for the building as well, we are out of space. Questions? Okay. Thank you, Ed. Board members have questions, comments for Ed? Go ahead. Uh, not a question. Just, you know, it's striking when it, uh, listening to Ed, and it's a great presentation, thank you, is just how comprehensive this problem is. I mean, you know, if you were to try to, you know, endeavor to say, how are we going to fix this? What are we going to do? It's, I mean, you know, it's across the board from, from common spaces, the classrooms and, and athletic areas. It's just, uh, I mean, it's, it's a big, as I said, comprehensive problem that, that you know, seems somewhat overwhelming. Um, you know, I, I did think of one question I, I jotted a note to myself, and I, I probably should know this, but I don't recall. When we tried doing some zero-hour classes, did that have any impact? <laughs> did that help? I, Very little. Okay. The chemi we did it with AP Chemistry, and first semester with zero hour worked pretty well. But then we found that as the as we moved into second semester, it became a drain on the students. Uh, the students just wore down by the end of the year. It was a challenge for them sure. getting up early. Many of those students who are who took uh, that AP Chem class were also involved in extracurricular co-curricular curricular activities so you know they were starting here at 615 in the morning but they weren't leaving until 10 o'clock at night mm -hmm. and so for those students who take those courses it is it's exhausting by the end of the year we have we will be offering some zero hour phi ed classes this next fall and we're hoping that that's going to have a positive impact on uh, on our students because the exercise in the morning then is going to, you know, it's proven that exercise does help students concentrate. But again, we're going, these are students who are highly motivated. They're going to be involved in many activities. They probably will still be here for extracurricular activities and co-curricular after school. So again, I think we've seen the cumulative effect where it wears you down at the end of the year. It just catches up with you yeah, and catches see. up with the students. One of the things that we incorporated this year was senior release, first and second hour and sixth and seventh hour, and that did relieve some of the congestion. And 
uh, but what it also did was it eliminated some students from taking some of the elective courses. Uh, they chose to pare back on their schedule and it did impact their, because they had the, the required graduation requirements, they chose not to take a band or they chose not to take a choir, they chose not to take an art class. And so we did see some, of, some impact in reduction in the number, the size of some of those classes. But as far as the congestion is concerned, it did help sixth and seventh hour, but we eat lunch fifth hour, and then the students would leave sixth hour. So those seniors who were leaving sixth or seventh hour, or sixth and seventh, probably had a class fifth hour as well. Mm -hmm. Other Thanks. board members, Brian? Uh, how about uh, online class, that we, uh, we doing, continuing that uh, next year? Yes, we have a, an online class in German next year. We have an online class in American Literature. American Lit was the first class that we had this year. And then we got enough students to take the online class in, in German. It's not been popular. And surprisingly, uh, I think students are, they like that social connection of the high school. And I've had questions from parents asking if we had to allow them to take the online course because the parents did not want them to be at home. They would rather have them here at school. So this is a transition period where we are going to have to educate our students about uh, the skills that are necessary for and the independence necessary to be successful with an online course. We did, Sandy, correct me if I'm wrong, but we did have um, strong interest by teachers into an online class that Nancy Toll is teaching for instruction. And uh, did we add an extra section? I know that was like full or something, but really strong interest in that. So we're moving forward, but certainly we have um, students and parents need to accept the class as well. We had uh, about 10 teachers who were intro who last summer, I believe it was, were trained to teach an online course. We're still doing a hybrid model, so they still have that social component, right? They, they still get yes. together every other yes. Every class. other day, right. One of the things that we are changing and adapting in our freshman year initiative class is to educate our students on how to take the online <clears throat> course. We have a couple of components of that where they are actually, uh, it's called Edulog, where it's a drug and alcohol program that they are actually taking online. And that will be our first step to help educate them to get more students involved or familiar with the technology so that they can, uh, hopefully it, it will grow and they'll be more interested in taking an online course later on. And of course, all of the work that, is, that will be done in our freshman year initiative class it'll be, uh, will be done on the computers so that we really want to emphasize for our freshmen how important technology is and how beneficial it is and uh, what an asset it will be for them as they become more proficient using it. I have a question regarding the capacity. The capacity of the high school is 1,680 students. Yes. And um, if we were at capacity, would, the, would the, this high school facility be adequate then? Or is there a number less than that that would fit, in a sense? We are extremely tight at 1680. And I think if we are looking at that capacity of about 1500, when students are leave for field trips, that's when we get a sense of what it is like in the building. Mm -hmm. And uh, several hundred of our students go to the Festival of Nations in the spring of the year. And when those students are gone, you can feel a change in the atmosphere in the building, and we have a couple of hundred students that, that are gone for that. 1,500 would be a comfortable number for this building. But of course, as we look at, you know, the, look at the remodeling of this building, we do need to begin to really seriously think about remodeling those science rooms, those science labs, to meet the goals of HSD 2025. Even with, even if the number were 1,500, we'd need to look at that. As, we'd need yeah. to look at that, yes. And I would, um, I, we'd actually have to look at if 1,500 would do it with renovation to update the facilities to um, 
meet the current instructional strategies and curriculum that we have. I don't, we don't know. It's more about the feel of the building with 1,500 works, but yet we've identified a number of areas that we need to add technology and um, make the spaces more flexible to update those programs. And we haven't really looked at you know, what size the building would be with that. We'd have to have architects come in and study it first. One of the things that we looked at with the architect discussed with the possibility of creating another classroom in the science area that had a combination of a little computer lab and an office area, we were thinking about taking that room and creating that into the classroom for the AP biology room. The structure, the structure of the room prohibited that because there was a concrete wall that was a bearing wall that went down the center of that room and the cost of taking that wall out, redoing the, the room and setting it up would have been prohibitive for just one AP class. Yeah. You know, Financially, it didn't make any sense. Excuse me, Ed, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, you know, one thing, Tom, I was kind of thinking along the same lines that you are what, as far as what, you know, the capacity is. And I really kind of have to even question, you know, the capacity of 1680. I mean, I, I don't know if, if, if some of those numbers were arrived at looking at you know, instructional areas only, but clearly the common areas of this building are woefully inadequate. I mean, if you've been here, and I'm sure you probably have, and during their passing, it's just remarkable. And I think the idea that they have to go out on the sidewalk is ridiculous. I mean, in this in this climate, and it's just infrastructure security. It just shouldn't have to happen, but I think it has to. So I don't even know. I mean. Saying rat capacity, I think, is, is kind of understating well, the what problem. I'm, what I'm interpreting or understanding mm -hmm. from the comments is, is that 1,500 would be, is a comfort level for capacity, mm -hmm. but it doesn't address the need for renovation for futuristic educational needs. So that's the right. and current. Mm -hmm. Tom, do you have a place to put those 200 students? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, Tom Kranz is here. Maybe there's there space at, at camp. Um, thanks, Ed, for the thorough report. And you know, I, as I as I look at this and I think about you know the different phases that this school has gone through. You know, when it was separate buildings, and then you know we added the the bridge or the between the two schools, and we added the science wing onto it, um, music, tech ed, expanding the cafeteria. I mean, we've really gotten a lot of good use out of this building. I don't think there's any question that, you know, we haven't, that we've not only used the building, but we've been creative, you know, with the use of the space. And, you know, I certainly want to thank you and your staff. And, you know, I think that goes to all of our schools, including the elementary schools and some of the challenges that they've had until we've been able to bring Rivercrest online. So space is the issue in this community and in the school district. So. Um, I know you and your team and Mary and her team have been working hard to try to figure out, you know, some solutions to this and we'll continue to do that because we're, you know, committed to making sure that our students receive the best education. The one, the one thing that, that bothers me, uh, I'll have to admit, is, you know, in going through this and, for example, seeing that we can't offer the AP biology, um, you know, we're limited with with the world language instruction, especially in light of HSD 2025 and the things that we want to do. Um, we have the orchestra program, you know, that's expanding and coming up through the grades. And we, um, we have a lot of things and goals that we want to achieve in the school district that, you know, are being somewhat compromised just because we're not able to, I mean, we're trying hard, we're, tr we're going to try to make it happen, but, you know, there's limits to what we can do. So, um, again, I applaud you for what you've been able to do thus far. I also want to thank um, St. Patrick's Church for, you know, they've been a, a great partner with us in, in offering, you know, car parking. And I know with um, when we've had emergencies and evacuations, they've had an open door for us over there. So, you know, certainly um, we need to appreciate the help that they've been able to provide us. So, thank you. Dan, I have a question, if I could just <clears throat> ask Ed uh, for his opinion on it. Um, uh, you know, I see, looking through this here, I see a lot of the issues with regard to technology and computer labs, et, et cetera. And, you know, I'm kind of wondering as we, as we go forward, and, and part of it, quite frankly, is just seeing my son who's now in college who is chained to his laptop, and, and that seems to be a really good 
curriculum delivery model. You know, I don't know, and I think I think across the river they they uh, experimenting with that, with issuing laptops, and and it's expensive, obviously, but you know, it, it could it could be a really I think an advantageous uh, curriculum delivery model. Question is, what I mean, how would you I guess assess uh, the uh, I mean, is the maturity level of the of the high school <laughs> group is that is that uh, would that work well? Do you think as 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 an option, something to look at? Well, I think we have different maturity levels. Okay. You know, we we have actually as our science is going through the curriculum review, we are looking at some models where students will use laptops in their class, and it'll mm -hmm. be a good pilot project to see how it's going to work, but. Uh, we're talking about responsibility. We're talking about students being able to take care of $700 plus uh, pieces of equipment. Mm -hmm. And uh, some will be able to do that. Uh, others will not be able to. Uh, I wouldn't incorporate it 9 through 12 immediately. I think we would have to look at individual classes and the types of classes, types of students that we have in those classes uh, in using that type of equipment. I think it'll be a good experiment, a good pilot project as we move forward in, in science to see how that works. One of our teachers, uh, Brian Petermeyer, has completely revamped his course so that he is going paperless. And I think that's a, a great uh, program that he's starting. Uh, he started it this year and next year he will be implementing it 100% and he's pretty excited about it. And it'll give us a good a good look to see how that will work. Indeed. Uh, but I think it is possible in some classes and with some students, but not across the board at this time. We need more education and we need a, a better transition program if we're going to move in that direction. Okay. I'd Thanks, like yeah. to just add to Ed and I both serve on the District Technology Council as well, and that is one of the conversations at the Technology Council, but again, we want to move very slowly and, and be planful on mm -hmm. how we want to incorporate and move forward with one-to-one -one computing within the district. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Ed. I think we'll... I want to add a couple things okay. at the end here. Certainly, we spent um, time this evening to talk about program concerns at the high school. And again, as Dan pointed out, um, the high school staff has been doing an excellent job of making maximizing um, this facility. But we're really at that max point. And um, we are committed to continuing to use this building well into the future. And that will be part of the options that we look at how to use this building and also provide additional space for learning. So that's something that is our challenge as we move forward and certainly our community as well for us to get feedback on that. But again, the building um, renovation can occur in the building. We can update things. We can combine rooms and so forth. But we have to look at how we can use this space um, in a more modernized way than we, we currently are as we look towards the future. Um, next month, we will be looking at the middle school as far as educational programming there and any concerns that we have. So we'll be doing the same thing, um, analyzing the middle school for you. And then one thing that, um, Ed, we will be br b bringing back to you is the number of classes uh, for this fall that we have that are over the class size guidelines so that you'll have that information as well. Okay, thank you, Mary. Again, thanks, Ed, for that report. Thank you. Uh, one last thing, if you get a chance before you leave tonight, uh, if you could take a walk over to the East Wing and take a look at the courtyard area that the student leadership team has been working diligently on this spring, they have created an outdoor classroom and it will be completely sustainable and they'll, future student leadership teams will also be working on uh, bringing technology into that area so that it can be really used as a classroom and it, it is a multi-purpose area so it was one of the last spaces that we had in the building that was totally useless and they really have and it has been the students 100 percent of the students with just a little bit of guidance from myself and uh, Hedberg uh, landscaping and contracting who donated many many hours to teach the students how to uh, create this garden area and courtyard area uh, they truly have done a wonderful job with it. So if you get a moment, uh, stop in and check it out. They're, they'll be putting the plants in tomorrow. Okay. Thank, thanks again. Thank Ed. you.
We'll move on to uh, topics for action, and I think at this point, um, oh, okay, Tom doesn't need to leave us quite yet. Okay. Uh, we'll uh, do the consent items, and I'll entertain a motion for approval of those. So move to approve the consent items. And do you want to give us the expenditures amount as well? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Um, okay. Uh, we have a motion for approval of the consent items. Do we have a second? I'll second. And we have a second. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motions approved. At this point, uh, I'll, I'll step out for the next two items. Okay. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> Wait a couple minutes here until Tom steps out. Okay, um, topics for action. Item B is the expenditures. Brian? Uh, Mr. President, move to um, uh, approve uh, the financial services be authorized to pay bills in the amount of $2,907,559.75. Okay, we have a motion by Brian. Second. Second by Barb. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 If those opposed, motion's approved. And we'll move on to item C, Rivercrest Facility Utilization Agreement with YMCA of Greater St. Paul, Camp St. Croix. Um, I believe we've reviewed this agreement previously, or you've described the agreement to us in the past, Tim, so do you want to briefly? Sure. Over that again. Okay. Uh, it's it will be the agreement that's loose leaf, not in your packet, uh, and this has been, <clears throat> like Dan said, has been reviewed by the finance committee. Uh, we made a, a couple of minor changes uh, to it, and really related to um, the uh, cleanup and supervision of rooms, defining that a little bit more on whose responsibility it is to do certain tasks. And uh, also, um, under the supervision, a uh, little bit of language change there. Uh, really, it's a YMCA's program, so that's making sure that uh, um, the, YM, the language is, flows correctly uh, in that area. Uh, but uh, the, if you turn to page two, or pa yes, page two of the agreement, uh, you can see that under usage of facilities, it describes the area uh, that will be utilized by the YMCA. It's approximately 2,825 square feet. And uh, it talks uh, at 1.3 about the time periods uh, for the operation of the school age care. And then section two talks about mutual use. Um, the YMCA, YMCA will also allow us to use uh, Camp St. Croix facilities. And uh, incidentally, I, Tom Kranz from the Camp St. Croix is here. So if you have any specific questions for Tom, he uh, would welcome those as well. And, uh, and I won't go into a lot, a lot more detail, but um, the other sections are pretty much standard verbiage for insurance and liability. And it talks a little bit about transportation and uh, different responsibilities uh, for the program. So. Okay, any questions for Tim? I believe our legal counsel has reviewed this as well, so. Uh, that is correct, yeah. legal counsel yeah, has I'm, reviewed it. I'm taking it, Tom, you've had sufficient opportunity to review this and it meets your approval. He's indicating yes. Um, so, with that, I'll Mr. President, uh, move to approve the Rivercrest Facility Utilization Agreement with the YMCA of Greater St. Paul, Camp St. Croix. We have a motion from Brian. Second. Second from Lynn. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motions approved. Thank you, Tim. And we'll get Tom back into the discussion here. While we're waiting for Tom, the next item is 11D, I believe that would be ratification of the 0709 custodial contract that Tim's going to go over. I'm just going to note that on the agreement that you just approved, we will obviously be filling in the dates um, in the first sentence on that agreement.
Anybody know Tom's cell phone number? <laughs> Thanks for the assistance, Mr. Kranz. <laughs> okay, we'll move on with uh, Tim giving us a report on the custodial contract. Okay, thank you. Uh, on uh, page, page uh, 23. 23, thank you. 23 is the uh, master agreement between the school district and the uh, West Central Education Association custodial unit uh, for the school district. And <clears throat> I'll just go through a few of the major items of the agreement. And uh, that would include on year, in year one, and if you turn towards the back of that contract to page either 21 or 44, it gives the uh, wage schedule and that for the most part is a 45 cent across the board adjustment for each one of those uh, cells and each one of those steps um, and that's for years, years one and two and that amounts to about a 2.7 anywhere from 2.7 to 3.8 percent increase on wages uh, we did however looking at uh, head the high school and middle school head custodians um, we felt to be competitive and comparable uh, to our other districts uh, to look at uh, a shift or an additional premium for those positions because of the number of people they supervise and the number of activities that they have uh, supervision over for their staff. So uh, those folks had an additional 50 cents. And <clears throat> on page 13, or 12 and 13, actually, the, and those are the, the top numbers, or 35 and 36. You'll see language in the contract regarding health insurance. And this language replicates, uh, the same. this is the same language, essentially, as what is in the teacher's contract. Uh, so what it does is it put caps on the district amount that the district will contribute and then has a workout clause if the insurance premiums go above a certain dollar amount. And so, uh, and I, I guess we had some, some additional language changes, fairly minor in nature. I won't go through all of those. If you're interested, you can certainly contact me and I can go through it individually with you if you'd like. So, uh, at that point, I'll... Tim, just a quick, um, you had said at the high school, middle school was 50 cents? Is that 50 cents instead of the 45 cent adjustment? Uh, that, that would be in addition. In addition to right. the 45. Okay. Yep. Any questions for Tim? Comments? If not, I'll entertain a motion for approval of this contract. Mr. President, move to approve the uh, 2007 through 2009 custodial contract. A motion by Brian. Second. I'll second by Mark. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motions approved. Thank you, Tim. Yes. We'll move on to the committee reports. Personnel, Mark. Yes, Dan, uh, the personnel uh, committee um, met May 21st and uh, discussed the uh, new job specifications for the uh, athletic activities uh, director. Uh, the recruitment, recruitment and selection process, and then we had a um, uh, closed session for uh, discussion of employee compensation of same. Okay, thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. 
We'll move on to facilities and grounds. Tom, do you have a report? Right. On May 28th, the Facilities and Grounds Committee met, and uh, one of the topics for discussion that evening was the review of the committee commission, which is found on uh, as agenda item 12B on page 47 for your review, just a, a listing of the functions and purpose of the committee. Um, in addition to that, we heard, as you've heard tonight, the Rivercrest Elementary School update with uh, a lot of enthusiasm in that and uh, pride. We uh, talked about the planning for the upcoming year 0809 in terms of projects and so forth um, that we are considering over the course of that, that fiscal year, um, as well as the summer projects. And uh, our last item, well, actually not the last item, but the 12, 6 to 12 space learning we heard from uh, tonight as well. And finally, we did have some discussion around energy management planning and the idea of, of uh, researching firms to look at the efficiencies in our facilities uh, for potential cost savings and so forth. So that was the report. All right. Well, it's a full agenda. Brian, finance. On the first in, uh, meeting of the new finance committee with uh, Barb and uh, yourself, Dan, and, and me. Uh, lots of uh, items we covered. I'll just hit the high points. Um, so uh, one is uh, talking about how we can uh, uh, reduce our, uh, our spend by uh, taking advantage of the uh, lower um, bond interest rates right now. And that's something that will be coming back with you in uh, July, I think it is. And. Uh, we got a briefing uh, from Tim on uh, changes in the uh, Administrative Service Center, specifically around uh, I'm doing uh, paperless payroll. So instead of setting out the uh, stubs, it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a new experience for many many members of the district, but probably one that will save us uh, a little bit of money. Also allows us scale and also probably provide a little bit more uh, kind of um, custom uh, custom information for people. So it's probably a good thing, but I'm sure it's going to be a few a few changes in, uh, in uh, how people do things, but uh, I think it will work out well. So, um, But that's good to see, and uh, it's certainly an area that uh, we can continue to uh, drive efficiencies and is how we run our business. So, so it's nice to see Mary and Tim and team uh, tackling that. Um, talked about uh, school age care budget. Uh, talked a little bit about our uh, draft, our budget goals, which we'll be talking more about in the uh, board meetings to come. And finally, just talked about um, financing capital budgets and kind of the plan for that. So that was it. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Any questions for those chairs of those respective committees? If not, uh, again, thanks for the committee work that's been done. Um, we, I don't believe we have any requests to speak. Um, and we do have an item for closed session. I would like to just... As we wound down the school year, I'd like to thank all of the administration, Mary and her team, and all the staff and faculty and everyone out in our schools that uh, have worked hard over the year and certainly appreciate it. I know Ed graduation went off without any problems and so appreciate um, your efforts with that. So with that, I'll entertain a motion to go into closed session. Um, move to uh, adjourn uh, to close session pursuant to Wisconsin statutes 19.85, parent 1, parent F, for the purpose of preliminary consideration of specific personnel problems and investigation of charges against an employee. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second. Second. We have a second. Any discussion? If not, we'll have a roll call vote. Robson, aye. Holland, aye. Bell, aye. Trina, Hoy, aye. Kaiser, shot, aye. Van Loonen, aye. Okay, thank you. Motion's approved.